first, I want to note that we're recording. We're recording in the large group, and we're also going to be recording in breakout rooms, and we'll be sharing the recordings with our community of colleagues. Our program this hour is going to take place in four sections. First, in a moment, we'll hear briefly from each of our facilitators. Second, I'll tell you about other new programming that JPRO is putting in place in the coming weeks for you and your colleagues. Third, we'll go into the breakout sessions with our facilitators for 25 to 30 minutes. And fourth, we'll share out and close all together. Well, before I turn it over to our facilitators, I want to remind you one more time, please, if you haven't yet, change your name in your Zoom video box. You just need to right click choose the rename option, put the group number that you want in front of your name, um, and maybe one of my colleagues can just share out the numbers now that my slide is down. Um, put the number in front of your name, um, and if you're having difficulty renaming yourself, you can simply put your group number in the chat. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to our facilitators in the order of your numbers, beginning with Ormars. Thank you, Alana. My name is Orr Mars. I work at the Wexner Foundation as a vice president. Um, and the topic that we'll be discussing is self-care with a focus on meditation. We're going to have a very short Jewish text to get us started. And then we'll share with each other uh, the best practices that we like to do for caring for ourselves. And then I'm going to guide us through a very short meditation, a blessing meditation because that is one of my favorite self-care methods. And it's good for the uh, beginner as well as the experienced meditator. Great, hi, I'm Becky Vorwinda. I'm a proud JPRO board member and the executive director of the Bronfman Fellowship. Um, the breakout group, group number two, we will focus on how do we support and connect with and care for our colleagues? Um, and we're gonna work together to brainstorm opportunities and ways to do that and to really um, enhance and deepen um, our sense of um, the challenges and, and um, creative possibilities that exist in this moment. Um, so I'll be looking to you, we'll be collaborating um, and I think uh, hopefully we'll have more to share out that can, that can then benefit the field in general. Hi, I'm Cheryl Cook. I'm CEO of Avoda. Um, our topic is vulnerable people. Uh, and we know that even now the number of vulnerable people is growing daily. So we're going to be talking about what it's like to be on the front lines working with vulnerable people. We're going to talk about how those of us who are not on the front lines can help support the organizations and people that are on the front lines and what kind of actions we or our organizations can be taking. We're going to be sharing best practices and I'm going to be joined by Rabbi Joanna Samuels, the CEO of Manny Cantor Center, who will be sharing her thinking as someone running a frontline organization. Hi, I'm Jeff Finkelstein, and you, I apologize because my printer's not working at home, so I have to look at my screen. Uh, I am the CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh, but as a land would like to point out more importantly I'm the immediate past uh, uh, chair of the board in all four topics because to take care of the community means focusing on the institutions things like the federation the agencies connected to federation agency loosely connected to federation the synagogues the startups it means focusing on the individuals in our community from a social emotional psychological level at the same time one needs to be thinking about how one takes care of oneself, how one cares for and supports one's colleagues, how one takes care of the vulnerable, et cetera. All of this is what makes, uh, what makes communities so, so if you can't, Jeff, thank you very much. Um, I think your sound is a little bit choppy, Jeff. So just as you, as we prepare for the breakout groups, you may want to 
um, do your audio by phone. Thank you all for those introductions. Um, I'm going to take just a moment now to show you a couple of things that JPR Network is working on. Um, and at the end of this call, we are going to send you a very brief, like 30 second, 45 second um, session sort of evaluation poll. And in there, we'd also be really happy to hear about other things that you think would be helpful for JPRO to be offering to our community at this time. Um, so here's a little bit of what we have coming. I'm just gonna pull it up on my screen here, okay. Um, so I imagine that many of you, um, by signing up for this program, are also aware that we have a different kind of a program taking place on Friday, which is to feature the way that three different organizations that have really been leading the way in their responses are functioning in this time. We're gonna hear from um, the three colleagues you see up on your screen a little bit about what, what is the approach to decision-making that their organization is taking right now there will be a panel discussion, and then there will also be breakout sessions where you'll be able to have the Q&A in more depth with one of our colleagues. So that's one thing that's coming uh, in a couple of days. In addition to that, you may be aware that um, an ongoing JPRO network program is called Well Advised, and Well Advised offers JPRO members free confidential advising with experienced colleagues. And um, we're working right now on getting well advised, stood up, not only for JPRO members, but for anyone who works in the field who needs someone to talk to about um, managing during these times. We're still working on the details and we'll announce this if and when it's ready. We're hopeful that in the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to offer this one-on-one um, -on -one support. Um, so those are two things that you can be looking to from JPRO. Um, and I am now gonna um, turn us over to move into our breakout rooms. You will be um, whisked away into your breakout room. You don't need to do anything. And then when it's time to, to come back, you'll be whisked back into the main room and we'll close that all together. Um, and again, to our facilitators, to our staff team at JPRO that has put this call together, thank you all very much. So it looks like people are still joining, but we're getting close. Um, excellent. So we are, as Laura just said, we are recording this breakout session. And additionally, my colleague at the Bronfen Fellowship, Stephanie Wiseman, um, is going to be uh, serving as a virtual whiteboard uh, note taker as well, so that we'll have something on paper at the end of our conversation. Um, so in a, in a little bit after we kind of get to know each other and, and I can introduce this topic a little bit further, I'll send um, in the chat function, I'll send a link to a Google Doc. So if you do want to follow along on that a little bit as well, you're welcome to, but that'll get sent out um, later. So um, hi, I'm Becky Vorwinda. Um, it's, really, um, it's really meaningful to me that we are taking the time um, together and that those of you that wanted to spend this time to, to connect in around how do we support our teams, how do we support our colleagues. Um, I imagine that some of you have direct reports and are um, 
thinking about how to um, support people who report to you. Others are in teams where you want to you want to think about how do you stay close to your colleagues, both for yourself in a time like this and also for them. Um, and I hope that we can address all of those topics together. Um, something that uh, was mentioned to me yesterday by someone was that we're now in a funny place where we're maybe getting to know even more intimate things about our colleagues than we ever could have imagined. Most of us have not been inside our colleagues' homes um, in, in an average week or year, or maybe we might one colleague or, or two, but um, you know, right this minute, everyone is in the same boat. We are working uh, primarily from our homes, um, those of us in the Jewish community, and, uh, and we are, uh, certain layers are coming off. Um, I think it positions us well as a Jewish community and as Jewish professionals in that sense that um, so much of what makes us great Jewish professionals is when we can bring our whole selves in um, and be as authentic as we can. Um, sometimes there's boundaries that we want to maintain and certainly this is an extenuating circumstance, but there's an opportunity um, that also kind of underpins this idea that another part of ourselves um, and, and our vulnerable selves perhaps are also coming out at a time like this. Um, so I wanna delve into that together as well today. Uh, starting since, since there is a lot of you on this call, I have a few questions and it would be great for people to raise their hands just to kind of get a feel for who's on and, and where you're at. Um, so my first question and raise your hand, keep it up for a moment if you can so people can see across the two screens here um, is, do you regularly, aside from during this coronavirus reality, do you regularly work from home already? And just raise your hand if that's the case, okay? All right, so you can put your hand down. Um, so of the people that are in this group right now, the majority of us do not normally work from home. So we are adjusting to a new reality. We're gonna be turning to those of you that just said you regularly work from home in a moment um, to give us some pointers as well. We're gonna continue on with a few other questions. Um, since starting to work from home, uh, perhaps for some of you that's just this week or maybe last week, have you had a day where um, maybe you were wearing pajamas or slippers or perhaps you're doing so in some way right now? Raising hands just to get a feel. Okay, I'll add to that. <laughs> um, great. So, so there's some comfort or some, some mixing of um, our inner and outer realities right now that are happening as well. Um, now talking about your dynamics with your colleagues. Um, have you learned something new about a colleague in the past three weeks during this coronavirus reality? And again, just raising your hands if you've learned something new about a colleague. Okay. Um, Obviously, without disclosing someone's personal situation, um, it would be great if um, anyone feels comfortable unmuting and just sharing generally what was it that, that you felt was new for you that you learned about someone. And we'll, we'll talk over each other, that's okay. <laughs> what people's living situations were like, just in terms of whether they were, um, whether they lived alone, whether they had roommates, um, things of that nature that I didn't always know. Yeah, yeah, so so sort of who else is in somebody's orbit, perhaps more so than, than we realized. Um, yeah, I've, I've also thought about that, getting to know, for example, that certain colleagues maybe have uh, a medical professional in their family or a loved one either in their home environment or outside their environment that they are concerned about right now. Yeah, those are things that maybe don't always come out otherwise. Um, another individual who maybe wants to share something they feel they learned about a colleague? I can go. Um, I've learned a couple of colleagues actually having uh, medical concerns in terms of like being immunocompromised and how this is actually impacting them. Yeah. And, and when you learned that, um, did you get any guidance from them or, or, or have any sense of ways that you could offer support to those who are experiencing that additional anxiety and fear? Uh, yeah, actually the, the one way that it showed up, um, I'm offering a couple of like small group coaching sessions for staff um, who are feeling like they need 
a little bit of help uh, managing the anxiety and one of the one of the participants today that was one of the things that had come up and luckily it, this person has normally lived in an apartment building has removed herself so she's with family someplace that she doesn't have to be worried so much about other like outside factors kind of coming into play um but yeah so we just kind of discussed some like good coping mechanisms of you know that she's doing everything that she can to kind of keep safe but yeah yeah well and i also love your what what you just said of how you're adding some trainings that you're able to offer perhaps mm. that's not what you might normally do or maybe it is but but there's something yeah, kind of <laughs> very interesting that's happening for people right now where various kinds of talents um, that we all have or skills that we can offer um, are also possible to offer to our colleagues and team members maybe more so now than when we're in a regular flow of work yeah definitely great thank you um so um okay so i'm i'm gonna um move us into uh this this sheet and sort of brainstorming in that because remarkably our time is going already rather quickly which is great um so i'm gonna share in the chat um hold on just have to sorry, get it right a um, google doc which again you you can look at you don't need to look at in order to to be part of this conversation um but what I wanted us to do together is really use the collective wisdom that's in this group um, to generate suggestions, approaches, things that are working, and things that we can add to. And, um, and I'll start by adding or sharing a few, a few things that I started populating this document with already um, in the context of what can, um, what can we do for, for our colleagues and for our team? How can we approach that in a way that, um, that's helpful? So I put up here um, in this document, there are two articles and I'm, I'm sure there are more and that we would love if people want to post into the chat any articles they've read, they found helpful around um, tips for remote work. Um, this, this first one was, was posted by Leading Edge. Um, additionally, there was a lovely email that Rabbi Amichai Lau Lavi sent out um, yesterday and he used this, this idea of thanks, wow, oops, please, um, and sort of these, these overarching ideas of how do we um, still maintain gratitude? Um, how do we also acknowledge uh, how complex and confusing this time is? Um, how do we forgive ourselves? And also how Becky, do we ask for what we, yes. Um, I think that there's a problem with the settings on the Google doc that you shared and it's not um, the link we're not able to access to see or edit it. Okay. So there should be um, a sharing thing at the on the top right hand corner that you can change the settings. Yep. Okay. Um, you know what? I Stephanie also has access to the sharing function, and I'm going to ask her to troubleshoot it right now. It's it's really okay if people can't see it. We will definitely get you guys the material. I'm going to cut and paste the helpful links for the time being in the chat, just because. I know myself and my tech multitasking will not use time well. Um, so first I will just share with you and I apologize guys about that. Um, these are those two helpful articles that I just mentioned. Um, and then um, I'm going to also cut and paste for you just what I so far populated and I'm gonna walk through these a moment as well. Um, but I do still would love for people to put into the chat any other articles or links that they've been finding helpful. Um, okay, and so now hopefully you can see in the chat some ideas for caring and connecting and I'm gonna I'm just gonna talk through these briefly before we open up for some brainstorming together. Um, so one of the one of the tips that that I want to focus in on for us is this idea of over communicating. It, it actually was something that was mentioned as well in this leading edge article. And, and really the idea is if you imagine um, all the small moments when you get cues as to what your colleagues are up to um, when you're in the same space as them, uh, which might include walking past and seeing what someone's doing on their computer or seeing someone um, at the water cooler at lunch and being able to, to stay connected. Now we have less of those opportunities. And so staying connected, um, sending messages, checking in, sending texts, again depends obviously 
directly on organizational policies, but, but using the tools to over communicate with one another at a time like this is really um, valuable. And I would say it's very important to note that this is, um, is multi-directional when, when we talk about this. So um, it could be very likely that folks are not sure whether to be communicating directly with a manager or supervisor who they perceive perhaps to be um, you know, under tremendous pressure or time pressure right now. Um, and so holding off until hearing from someone or similarly a colleague who, as we as we opened at the start of this, you know, a colleague who maybe is vulnerable or um, or struggling right now. Again, just the more that one can communicate and keep people part of the team and keep people um, connected, the better. Um, so that's one tip there, and we're going to delve into some more of these after I, I just run through this list. Um, Next tip here, and I want to I want to just say something which sounds I have to be frank, like a little not just a little a lot morbid. Um, but as I was thinking last night about um, how to prepare for this, and I did a little googling, looking are there people writing about the question of how are teams functioning, not just in the sense of collaborating for productivity, but collaborating for empathy. I didn't see a lot um, that was already out there on on the web yet. Um, but what I did look up was what are tips that people are given when a colleague is facing a challenging situation like terminal illness or a relative who is sick? So what are, what are things that are recommended for teams and for, for colleagues in those moments? And, um, and you know, there's obviously a medical component to the coronavirus circumstance right now as well. But even beyond that, there are some analogies perhaps, unfortunately, to what it feels like when somebody is dealing with terminal illness in the sense of um, anticipatory grief, um, paralysis and uncertainty around planning and making decisions, um, a, a, a challenge of when to talk about the thing that is on one's mind all the time, um, and a need for a support network. And so, so there are some, some analogous elements for us as a team. And so I, I just want to say I, I pulled from some of that as well as I was thinking about this session. Um, so for example, the, this idea of talking openly about the elephant in the room, though some of us are of course already feeling that we don't wanna keep talking about the coronavirus um, and the daily realities and checking in on how each of us is feeling or how our colleagues physically are feeling. Um, again, in that over communicate sort of category, there's also real opportunity to, to keep talking about it and talking about these feelings um, and checking in with, with colleagues and peers. Um, <clears throat> establishing a practical support network, the idea of um, there are two layers to, to our days. There's both the work and getting the work done, but there's also now the, the overlap between the professional demands and the personal demands where there's less of a boundary um, and buffer between those two for, for us and our colleagues. So talking ex extensively with team members about how do we support one another? And also what are the supports that people are putting in place through their own personal networks to help them manage that? And who's maybe lacking in some of those? Um, so again, really uh, boundaries that, that maybe we wouldn't normally be crossing into beyond just talking about the projects we're working on, taking the time to talk about how are we overall resettling in and um, how are we supporting each other in that is, is invaluable right now. Um, in that same way, going slow to go fast. I mean, some of these are these cliches, um, but, but this is really true right now as well, which is everyone um, who is in response roles or also who are dealing with either financial insecurity for their organizations or um, programmatic holds um, and staffing questions, you know, for everybody in various ways, there's a there's a, um, a ratcheting up of how much has to get done or thought about right now. And then simultaneously, um, the slowing down is one of the biggest gifts we can give to one another right now. Um, we had a, a staff meeting for my organization yesterday, um, and we employed an activity that um, uh, we often do with our students. Um, an activity that just involved some breathing at the start of our meeting, just to kind of resettle into each other. And we took time for a, a real personal check-in, um, more than we might have on a regular uh, 
uh, work meeting, uh, team meeting, and, and really encouraging that in the group space, but also encouraging that with each phone call, you know, um, or with each Zoom call to just take those extra five, six minutes or more if someone needs it to really check in on a personal level. These are the kinds of moments that will have long-term benefits overall for the deepening of your team dynamic and of your trust in one another. Um, so it's not ever wasted time. Um, now, also forgiving yourselves and others in advance. Um, there's a lot of emotions uh, and, and a lot of reactions that we're all vacillating and I'll call it sort of seesawing between. Um, and so both for ourselves, um, being kind to one another, you know, I wish we could simultaneously be an origin about healthcare because I think it matches so, so closely with the spectrum of colleague care. Um, but also to, to have more um, willingness to give the benefit of the doubt to peers when people may um, perhaps be short with one another during this time or um, switch between very negative feelings about what, what our next steps might be on an on a, um, organizational priority and then maybe that, you know, switching back to more optimistic or creative energy. Um, people are going to be moving at different paces and that's something for us that we'll want to really take note of, which is it's gonna be harder for all of a team or for even two colleagues talking to one another to totally be on the same emotional page in a meeting or even to have some of the in-person cues that we would normally have to get into sync on our um, you know, kind of emotional status as we start an important conversation. And so again, going back to the over-communicating, working to name where someone's at, even start with that check-in and see if someone says, I'm really having a hard time today, or I'm feeling so frustrated or overwhelmed today, to contextualize what the next part of the conversation might feel like um, and to, to give the benefit of the doubt or to agree to revisit a conversation because of how someone's feeling right now. Um, the last two items that I wanted to, to mention, and then we've got luckily 15 minutes to open up and start to brainstorm and add to this together. And also I'm happy to delve further or hear um, reactions or, or alterations to some of what I'm sharing, because obviously I do not by any means feel like an expert in this moment right now. Um, so, so around organizational and workday priorities, um, setting and resetting priorities, there's going to be a lot of recalibration, just as there's recalibration for all of us um, in our own lives trying to get work done at home while also um, being in, in our lives, um, there's also going to be a lot of setting and resetting of organizational priorities over the next week and then month and then months. And it's, it's going to have a long impact. Um, we we as, as a field are going to have a long way to go um, with where we're at right now. So just again, as a team, the over communicating, I don't think it's over communicating, it's the right amount of communicating, but communicating explicitly to your colleagues what work priorities you have, whether it's what your priorities are that day, checking in with them about theirs, um, seeking clarification from your managers or from your, your colleagues who you are collaborating with on what their priorities are or how a project is shifting. Um, we, we can easily make assumptions at a time like this, and we have to really seek clarification and accept and be forgiving as things may continue to change, um, even as we're just getting our footing again. Um, and, so, and so my last item that I wanted to, to offer here um, personally is, is connected to what I mentioned where um, our team had a chance to do some breathing together, creating some rituals and, um, and identifying when you are um, checking in with, with a colleague or again, if you're um, checking in with a team, perhaps during this time where people are working from home, deciding on one thing that you're always gonna do at the start of that conversation or one thing that you're gonna do to close that conversation or perhaps come up with um, ways to have virtual meeting spaces or meeting times, right? So it could be not necessarily a Zoom in person even, but if your team uses Slack or other platforms, you know, to have a certain channel that you add um, for people to, to touch base or add some humor 
Um, it could be um, ways for teams to um, just essentially create routine and, and ritual around this, this other demar demarcation of time that we're in right now, because um, it's not going to be um, a very, very short-term experience. This is going to be something that uh, is, is re, um, resetting a new normal for us and, um, and hopefully not a new normal forever, but for a period of time that is um, substantive enough that just as for any of you perhaps who had a, a, a leave, let's say had a, a maternity leave at some point or whatever, and then came back in and had this restarting experience, um, I predict that that's going to be some of what will happen for all of us when we do eventually move back to our workplaces day in, day out in person. And so this is really um, a resetting and, and we need to honor that and recognize that this is that moment as a team and as individuals to be resetting. So um, thank you for indulging me in, in quite a long um, list over there after all. Um, but now I really wanna open it up. And what I'd really like to do is, as I noted, um, either things that people have already experienced that have been playful, creative, um, generative that they'd like to offer to the group. You can either put it into the chat or even better if you unmute and share um, or questions or things you want to deepen around uh, what we started with. Hello, can you hear Hi. me? Yeah. Hi. yeah. So um, I do um, a lot of normal um, engagement with our staff. So I've been sending um, links for example, the Cincinnati Zoo actually has like a home safari and they do a vir virtual tour every day that they post. So I usually try and send one kind of fun type thing. Um, and then I'll just send other webinars that are going on, um, maybe some children's resources because they have children that are home with them. So I kind of try to keep the balance of professional but something that's uplifting. And I get really great feedback when I send something like that um, because it's also recognizing like our data department right now and our communications department are slammed. And I do trainings which have all been canceled. So I'm not quite as busy with work. And so, um, you know, finding the balance so everybody sort of has everything. And then even when they take a little break that they have something to kind of engage themselves with. We also have someone on staff who's doing weekly meditation sessions during lunch. Um, there's a yoga app that I sent out that's waiving their fees so that people are able to use that resource to find yoga or um, you know, some kind of relaxation as far as that goes. And then we're just making sure everything we do is recorded. So if somebody's busy at the time, they can go back and listen to the recording and have that moment of escape or relaxation. Those are fantastic suggestions, Fran. Those are awesome. I, I love the point about recording um, any kind of, I guess I'll call it extracurricular, but you know, enrichment experiences that people can then still access if the timing doesn't work. Um, having someone just noted a jokes channel on Slack and having you know, sources to share such as the virtual zoo. Um, those, are, those are fantastic. And, and also, again, just raising up something that also came up um, with Angie before, this idea of people sharing what their extra skills, so to speak, can be. Um, and then, friend, something else that you said that was wonderful was recognizing that some people are slammed and some people have more um, flexibility and being willing to step up to offer um, a pair of hands or to offer the skills and to be explicit about the skills you can offer if you are in boat of you know your projects are grounded at the moment for example those are all just so wonderful and then i'll just also add that i have lunch with the same group of of girls every day and so we kind of have our lunch group and we first started out kind of sharing memes and then we would just kind of joke like it's 12 o'clock it's lunch time um, and we've actually set up a zoom lunch for next tuesday that we're all kind of gonna virtually have lunch together. So it kind of is just a midday chuckle, you know, with everybody. Um, we have our whole staff um, WhatsApp group that's kind of more informative, um, but we've kind of set up little kind of social groups of people that we normally interact with. I saw you guys send something out about doing virtual lunchroom. 
where everybody can kind of sit around, which I thought was a great idea on the bigger scale because we just kind of do it with our little lunch bunch click, but certainly for everybody to have that interaction. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you, Fran. Others who want to unmute. I just want to offer one, one idea. Um, our organization just uh, scheduled a staff pre-Shabbat gathering on Zoom. This is like over 400 people, but there is going to be you know, some, some conversation, some celebration of Shabbat. It's B BYOB, um, and uh, it's just like a very nice way to end the week, particularly since so many people also aren't able to go to synagogues and, um, and experience that. That's that's wonderful and, and, and such a great reminder that for, particularly for those of us because we work in Jewish organizations and there's um, Shabbat every week that we can rely on, there's nigunim and songs that we could be singing, um, there are so many ways to bring some Jewish learning and ritual in and often many of our orgs have ways to, to help make that happen. Thank you. Other, other comments, or I also want to um, add or ask that if anyone um, has a need that they think would be important to express so that those of us can enhance our own understanding of the kinds of things that our colleagues may be seeking um, from each other, that also would be very welcome in this space right now. Becky, my team is um, very outward facing. We're fundraisers and uh, working on plan giving and um, annual campaign. And it's been very difficult for the team to, as you say, go slow to go fast because we're usually going fast. Um, so it's been really um, interesting to take a step back and relook at our work and to figure out ways to still stay connected. And um, we started making phone calls to some of our donors and it's been very, um, heartwarming that we reach out to some who are isolated and um, having a real hard time struggling and just um, having a phone call from us has been very um, helpful to them and, and you know then there are some who are out playing Maj at the pool and um, and that's okay too but um, I think the more we stay in touch with them being outward facing as we are and not putting the ask in they realize how much we care about them so um, and that that's helpful for us too um, as workers, so we're encouraging that as much as we can. And That's, yeah. pull, uh, pulling out the pen and paper because getting a special note in the mail, I've gotten um, feedback from that too. Um, people don't get handwritten letters anymore and in a time like this, it's really helpful. That's wonderful. Yeah, it also probably, it, 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 we're all looking at our computers more than we might even like to right now. So, so taking a step back and doing something like writing a note both writing a note to, let's say, donors or other stakeholders or to colleagues could even be um, a really wonderful, a wonderful thing. And I, I love also the lens with which you just shared that, Deb, which is seeing the opportunity as one of deepening relationships, in this case, with, with those donors and to do something that you might have always wanted to be doing is those kinds of check-ins in general. To be able to do that now, it's especially meaningful and, and it's a way of taking the extra time, so to speak, that you wish you be doing something else now you're wishing you're doing this in the sense that this is a meaningful activity as well um great others who want to add i have a question that came up in a in a meeting that i was on right before this um and some of us were talking about um and maybe this is unique to to us in chicago we have in the past think week, uh, probably three or four colleagues who have new babies uh, born like since March 1st. And some of us were thinking about what are the ways that we might be able to support the colleagues who normally we would be able to, um, you know, go see after a short time or who would be inviting people to um, a naming or a bris or something, and now there's no way to do that. And so I wondered if anyone had any any ideas for reaching out to those colleagues who are either coming back um, 
from a leave of any sort and into this or who are leaving now and are you know gonna miss all of the camaraderie or you know battle scars or whatever it is for those of us who are who are making this transition together thanks for naming that because also i think you're raising up one of those considerations that might not be front of mind for those of us which is um, team members who already were absent for whatever reason um, or who have other life cycle moments, um, whether it's a new baby or an upcoming bar bat mitzvah or a wedding or whatever else that might be impacted. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have a little less than a minute left. If there are folks who have responses, the one thing I would say that comes to mind on my end um, is, is I think that there's um, there are opportunities sort of connected to even what Fran was saying of having, you know, a, a virtual lunch together to invite some of these colleagues at the appropriate moment to a virtual baby shower or to, um, to let's say, source through, you know, a, a shared Google Doc baby advice or, um, or other favorite memories that people have um, that they want to share with, with that colleague and sort of as a, as a meaningful gift that doesn't have to be a physical gift even. Um, and, and also how to celebrate people's simchas or offer them support from afar in, in losses too. I think this is this is wonderful. Ilana, this means this is who's in the group right now, or this is there going to be more? In the group right now, and um, oh, we're recording. Yeah. We're good to go. Thank you so much, Or. No, absolutely. I'm actually very happy to see that it's a smaller group. Nervous that it would be you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, people on the call, but no, that's good. Um, anyway, welcome everybody, um, your dear colleagues, and we're all in this holy work together, so I'm glad we could be here together. Um, I see some familiar faces here, um, and some who are new, so I hope I get to meet you at other times, but we're not gonna have really a chance to do that uh, right now. Just wanna remind you that uh, this, gr this, this breakout group is being recorded, um, and we're not going to do individual introductions just because we don't have a lot of time, but we will have um, some time for sharing later because I think the group's just the right size that if some people want to speak up and share, that is totally fine. So the other part of it I'm going to say is going to be quite frontal just in the nature of Zoom and the nature of the time we have. Um, and I just hope that you'll, you'll stick with me. Um, so um, with that said, uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, I'm the vice president of the Wexner Foundation. Um, and uh, Im an important part of my own self-care is meditation, particularly Jewish meditation. Um, it it um, not only gives me a sense of uh, spirituality and equanimity and calm in my life, but I actually think it's a leadership skill that I bring into my professional life. Um, when I have to deal with heady situations or difficult conversations, um, it doesn't give me the answers, but it allows me to kind of see more clearly as I engage with, with uh, constituents and colleagues. And um, that's my kind of self-care, but I know that we all have different kinds of self-care. My first job as a Jewish professional was uh, at a very scrappy a uh, kosher food pantry, it's not so scrappy anymore, but it was in LA called Sova. And I remember when the director uh, was handing me the keys of the uh, beat up pickup truck uh, to be the new director. And as he was giving me the keys, he said to me, you know, this truck will not run if you don't put gas in it. And that's true for you as well. You need to give yourself the stuff you need to, to be able to do this holy work. And uh, that has stuck with me for the last 30 years, that lesson, is that we may think of self-care as being something that's very selfish. And initially, if it just stops right there, it is. But honestly, we can't care for the people that we are supposed to care for in our personal lives and the communities that we work for if we are not strong as well, if we are not feeling cared for, and if we are not taking ourselves um, seriously in that regard. So I'm going to see if I could share my screen in a second, because I do have one sec. Share screen. I do have some stuff I want to present this way. Okay, I think 
think it's working. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, good. So this may be, a, I'm gonna go very quickly through this text, but I think it's appropriate and maybe something that's familiar to many of you. And if not, then I'm so happy to be the one to introduce it to you. It's very special to me. Um, and it comes from the Babylonian Talmud. And it's a story of Rabbi Chia Bar Abba who gets sick. And obviously right now we're in a situation where lots of people are getting sick. And his friend Rabbi Yochanan came to him and Rabbi Yochanan asked him, are your sufferings precious to you? And Rabbi Chia Bar Abba said, no, I, they're not precious to me. I don't want these sufferings and I don't want any kind of reward that comes with whatever character building suffering has. So Rabbi Yochanan, the visiting friend said, give me your hand. And Rabbi Chia gave him his hand and Rabbi Yochanan raised him up out of his sickness. So he somehow healed him magically just through the love of their friendship. And then that same healer, Rabbi Yochanan, the one who was the healer just a second ago, got sick. And Rabbi Hanina, a different rabbi, comes to him and says to him, are your sufferings precious to you? They have the same conversation. And Rabbi Yochanan, the former healer, who's now the sick one, says, nope, I don't want them. They're not precious to me. I don't want any kind of reward that comes with suffering. So Rabbi Hanina said, give me your hand. And he gave him his hand. And Rabbi Hanina raised Rabbi Yochanan up out of his sickness. So then the Talmud itself asks, why is this so? Why did Rabbi Yochanan not just heal himself. Rabbi Yochanan should have raised himself up. He was able to heal Rabbi Chia beforehand. Why couldn't he heal himself? And then the Talmud poetically answers itself. They say a prisoner cannot get himself or herself or their selves, I got to change that, out of jail. Meaning that for us to be free, for us to be healthy, we need each other. We are the ones who give care to our communities and the care need givers need care. I'm sure you've been in situations where you're giving advice to friends and you feel very wise, but if you were having the same issue, you wouldn't be able to give yourself that same advice. And that's true for this story in the Talmud, and it's true for us today suffering with the coronavirus right now, is that we need to take care of each other. No one can get themselves out of jail. So I'm going to... Uh, stop the share here and i'm going to ask all of us to now share a little bit you know i was going to do this by chat but there's enough of us and it's an intimate enough group for us to uh, kind of share with our voices and i would love to hear your voices so i started this by saying meditation is something very important to me but there's other ways i take care of myself and i want us to share with each other the different ways we take care of ourselves it doesn't have to be earth shattering because most things that we do are obvious and we still don't do it. So just hearing each other say, you know what, this is something that's very important to me. It's not gonna be, it may not be something new to you, but it may inspire you to say, you know what, there's something important to me too, and I'm gonna do that as well. So I wanna invite you um, to unmute yourself. Um, and for those on video, just kind of raise your hand like that. We're gonna be very low tech there, and I'll just call on you. And then, and then after the video people get a chance to share, I'll call on the people who seem to not be on video to see if they want a chance. So any video people want to uh, share a, a, a self-care right. practice? I'll go first. Sure, uh, Okay, I love music. I love to play the piano. And something you just said really struck a chord. I know both of those things relax me and they allow me to take care of myself, but I don't do them. Or should I say, I don't do them as often as I should. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, someone else? Yeah, it's Gavin here. Hi, Gavin. Hi. Two things that I, I find very helpful and attempt to do regularly are exercise and making sure I get fresh air. Regardless of the surroundings, I think they're both important and as regular as possible are, are certainly helpful. It's embarrassing for me for how many days go by where I walk into the office in the morning and don't breathe fresh air until I leave in the evening. And I always kick myself. Why didn't I just walk outside for two minutes? Exactly. Does someone else go want out to for share? lunch. Go for a walk. I should. I, I should. We all should. <laughs> Any other people have something they want to share? I'm yeah. happy to share. Um, I uh, cook for myself a lot, for myself and my husband. I get a lot of like stress out of sort of chopping things. And sometimes it works out well and other times it doesn't. But I, I always feel better about myself when I prepared the food that I ate in a day. 
It's so good. Yes. I can't read your name from there, but yes. Oh, you're on mute. Okay. There you go. Hi, Barry here with my husband, Dave. Hi. Um, Hi. One of the things that I've been thinking about lately for, as far as self-care is making sure I have a drink of water with my breakfast in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's like very simple, but when I don't do it, I'm actually more cranky. <laughs> I didn't realize how hearing all these things are all things I aspire to and how guilty I'm feeling right now, <laughs> how easy it all is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, yes, Robin. Hi, Or. Um, I have a, you know, we're all Jewish professionals, I assume, and oddly enough, the, one of the ones that has really been working for me of late is actually prayer. Um, mostly spontaneous. Um, I'm sort of feeling the structure of prayer um, and communal prayer right now seems with no one sitting in the congregation, um, I'm a rabbi, as something that wouldn't work for me. And in fact, I was on another, I was on a conversation yesterday and many people were discussing how, yes, they're going to be leading worship this Friday night or Saturday morning from an, you know, in an empty sanctuary to their to their congregation, and I just can't imagine myself, you know, chanting something with nobody there or reading something. So, so I'm finding more spontaneous prayer. Um, the other thing I have recently found is that I've had a return of a medical condition of some pretty serious bursitis that I had many years ago, and I had some physical therapy that helped. And I was looking it up and what are some of the causes or what can bring make it really bad. And I confess that one of them was caffeine. And so um, I hadn't known that. And in the last several months, I had been drinking a whole lot more caffeine than I normally do. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is figure out where my body might not be feeling its best and what I can do um, not just fresh air and exercise and things like that, but if there are also ways I can just make small adjustments um, because if my body is not working well, then I'm not in a position to uh, reach out to others. Absolutely. Um, I wanna give a chance uh, because I can't see your visual signals um, for anybody who is not on video or on a phone to just kind of speak up and if two people go, I'll kind of negotiate that. So just go for it, any of you on the phone or not, if you want. And I'll just add, if, if you're on the phone and you're trying to speak, you need to press star six to unmute yourself. Um, and we will confirm that we can hear you and just, just so that you're not speaking into the ether while, while muted. Okay, so I'm assuming they don't have what to share right now. Um, one leadership skill I've developed um, as being a meditation teacher is I could sit in silence with a group for a very long time. So uh, with Zoom, I don't want it to go that long. <laughs> but you know, when someone doesn't have an answer, I'm always happy just to sit and push it just a few more, few more seconds and be patient with that. Um, these are all great things and really so important um, for us to hear and all things that likely we could relate to. I knew, I knew there wasn't going to be some radical idea coming out. And I think that's exactly the issue with self-care is that we are all in a giving and, and people helping profession and we're generous and we're generous to a fault literally because the fault goes against ourselves. Um, and we have to find that right kind of balance. Um, so even, even these things, cooking, music, exercise, drinking water, prayer, eating healthfully, these are all things that we could write the article. The thing is we have to do it. And so I wanna encourage us to, uh, especially those who said it out loud, to, I didn't ask you to make this a commitment to the group, but maybe it could be a commitment and that it's something you do after this call or sometime tomorrow. Um, for me, as I said earlier, um, mindful meditation is really a very important outlet in so many different ways. And we don't have a long time for me to go into all the different ways 
that I find it to be helpful. Um, but I can only speak personally now that it allows me to focus on living in the present moment. Um, that allows me to see things as they really are, because ultimately the present moment is really all I have. I'll only speak for myself, and you'll, you'll try it and, and see how it feels for you if you're new to it. Um, it's really all I have. Everything that happened in my past, um, it's, it's gone. It already happened. Um, and everything that's going to happen in my future, it doesn't exist yet. So all I really have is this present moment. And it's very interesting because all of my anxieties seem to exist in the past. I call those regrets. And in the future, I call those worries. And in the present, not so much. You know, maybe sometimes my, my present is I'm fully mindful of how anxious I am right now. But usually, if I'm able to kind of see things as they really are, I'm able to say, you know what? The anxiety is in the past. And the worries are in the future, and I'm focusing on the present moment. Now, I am, am I some you know, Zen monk who could fully live in the present all the time? No, I'm actually pretty bad at it, which is exactly why I practice meditation all the time. I run a meditation group here in Columbus, and people say, oh, yeah, you, you know, you're, the, you're the Zen guy. And I'm like, no, it's actually the opposite. People who are going to meditation are the ones who need to work on it. Um, so what I'd like to do is... Um, I'm going to put something up on the screen again. One sec. Let's see if I can find this. Okay. Sorry about this. Just maybe it's still up there. Let's see. Share screen. Ah, here it is. Okay. No, that's not it. That's just the. Sorry. One second. Forgive me. There we go. Um, or it looks like we're seeing your desktop, which means that if yes, you ma want, you could. Um, I'm going to try one more time because it is showing up on my sh share screen, but not showing up for you. So give me just one second. Um, while Or is, is pulling that up, I, I want to um, <laughs> take the privilege of a personal shout out um, to, to Gavin, who was the founding board chair of URA, URJ Camp George, which was my first Jewish job. Um, and I'm feeling a little bit emotional looking. I think, Gavin, is that picture behind you, a picture of Camp George from the air? Absolutely. Well, here we go. Really meaningful to be seeing you and seeing that picture so many years later, Gavin. Yeah, thanks. OK, so actually, Jewish life has um, something built into it that allows us to appreciate the present moment. Um, and those are blessings. So what I wanted to do is start, if you're comfortable with this blessing, the Shehechianu, which is literally the blessing for the present moment. And you may say, you know what, this present moment kind of is not good right now. But there is actually, it's kind of miraculous that we made it to this very moment, even to see the, the, the stress that our society is going, uh, going uh, that is in right now, and the fact that we have trained ourselves as Jewish professionals to intervene in some way to make this stress and this suffering just a little less painful. So if you would like, I'm going to invite you to say it with me in Hebrew and then in English. Totally up to you. The Shehechianu. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Shehechianu v'kiyamanu v'idiyanu l'azman hazeh. Blessed are you, Holy Oneness, who gives us the life force to bring us to this present moment. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now is I, I'm, I invite you to get comfortable. If meditation is your, is your thing, then you're already comfortable with this. And if it's not, then I thank you for putting yourself um, in this uh, new situation. I'm going to keep them very short and very guided so you will not be left hanging. I will tell you exactly what to do. So the first thing is, don't even worry about not thinking about anything because everyone says, oh, I, you know, meditation is completely emptying your mind. Nope, it's not that. We could talk more about that later. 
I'm actually going to give you something to think about. You can think about it whatever you want. They're only suggestions. But I'm going to share with you a, a focus phrase for your breathing that is connected to what's going on in society right now. So I want you to be comfortable. If you want to, you can close your eyes. And we're going to take 10 breaths between each one of the four meditations I'm going to give you. And then we're going to go into one where we're just going to take five breaths for each one. For those that are sick, breathing in, I bless you with a complete recovery. Breathing out, I bless you with refuah shlema. In, complete recovery. Out, refuah shlema. For those that work in healthcare, breathing in, I bless you with strength. Breathing out, I bless you with health. In, strength, out, health. For those that are losing wages, child care, those seeing their project or programs get canceled, and our colleagues all over the continent, breathing in, I bless you with calm. Breathing out, I bless you with patience. In, calm, out, patience. For our leaders, breathing in, I bless you with wisdom. Breathing out, I bless you with courage. In, wisdom, out, courage.
And now we bless ourselves. We'll take five breaths in between each one. I bless myself with health. I bless myself with compassion. I bless myself with calm. Finally, I bless myself with peace. Thank you for doing this with me. I just think there's a holiness in the work we do, and therefore we each have sparks of holiness coming out of us. And so often we're just worried about budgets and meetings and you know our own communities. And to gather together like this as professionals who really are all lifting the same thing together, it just means a ton to me. So what I'd like to do is invite any kind of sharing that you wanna do right now. This is also a meditation practice. Um, we practice speaking our truth, and then the others will practice listening deeply without judgment or reacting while focusing on our breathing. And I will say just as a commentary, for me, this is the most important leadership skill that I gain from meditation is to be able to listen intently to what the person in front of me is saying hopefully without judgment and without reacting and just hearing what they have to say fully in the present moment. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you to, um, I think the way we'll do it is in the chat, just write, I'm here, you know, like this. Is this check on everyone, Ilana? Oh, it is. Okay, don't do the chat. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. No, no. It's just going to... It's this group. just within this group. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, so you just do something like this, and then I'll just call on you, and you know, don't, don't go on for too long, and don't expect someone to respond to you, so don't ask a question that you actually want answered. Would anybody like to share? Jacqueline, please. Thank you. I'm really working on the living with uncertainty that this sort of world has brought us into, and it's something I'm really not good at, but I just every day is a new day, but there's nothing that I can do that I'm not already doing. So I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with the best that is my effort from my apartment and, and making myself be comfortable with it is challenging, but I'm working on it. That's where I'm at. Thank you. Becca, 
please. Um, I was going to say, I'm trying to work on balance, and I appreciated that kind of being reinforced now. Um, as we were sitting quietly, I can hear it's raining outside. So it's this beautiful, soft, like pitter patter of rain. And then I can hear the movie that's playing downstairs that's keeping my children occupied right now. And I think that's for me every day, it's finding some calm in the middle of this chaos that we're in, like Jacqueline said. So remembering that it will be quiet and it will be loud at some times, but it will pass. We just have a few more minutes. We have time for sharing them. And if you're on the phone or not on video, just speak up if you want. Star six, right? Elena, we'll unmute you. Would anybody else like to share? Okay, Elena. Um, I noticed toward the, the end of the meditation um, when, when um, we were blessing ourselves and we blessed ourselves with, with good health. My, the thought that came up for me was I need to take care of myself because I need to take care of all these other people. Like I, I had this moment, I, I, I found myself getting emotional, like somehow just blessing myself with health for the sake of myself and not for others felt hard. Um, and then I don't know. And then I had a lot of feelings about that and um, and it was good to connect with those feelings because I think I've been in adrenaline mode and it was good to pause and just sort of like feel that deep down place that I've just sort of been ignoring for the last couple of weeks. Thank you. So we, we need to uh, wrap up. So I'm just going to share my screen one last time. And I just want to share this actually from a representative from Ohio who is a mind, mindful practitioner, Tim Ryan, and he writes, writes this about the United States. Maybe I know some of you are in Canada too, so let's extend it. A mindful nation is about recognizing that we are all connected. We are all in this together. At present, we feel divided and scared and have been made to believe that independence mean we are totally on our own. But our experiences as individuals and as a country tell a different story. We know that when we join together, work together, and care about each other, our freedom actually increases, as does our health, as we found out. Real independence emerges when we know how to support each other. The Declaration of Independence was a communal act. And that's also true for whatever kind of self-quarantine we're doing. It is a communal act. John Kabat-Zinn, a doctor who's very well known in the mindfulness community says, sometimes just stopping is a radical act of sanity and love. And that's what we need to do in our personal lives. And I think what's going on right now, as hard as it is, is a communal act of mindfulness and an act of sanity and love. By us self-quarantining and then taking care of our communities from here, from our houses, we are practicing sanity and we are increasing love. And I am very honored to be in this field with you to do that together. We have 40 seconds left, so I'm gonna do an advertisement, which is one silver lining of this whole situation is that the meditation group I run in Columbus on Shabbat mornings from 10 to 11:15 is now on Zoom. So if you would like to participate in that, then please send me your email and I will send you a reminder. The other thing is that I am absolutely available to you to answer any questions you have. And if you want to set a 10 minute or 15 minute appointment to meditate together, let's do it. It'll keep me honest. Thank you, everybody. or your staff in the process. Um, and so I see some of you have started to post what you do, which is wonderful. Um, does anyone want to sort of start and share a little bit about some of the work that you or your organization is doing, if, especially if it is, if you feel like it really is a good practice and you're proud of a piece of the work that's happening? 
I'll start. My name is Sherry Moore and I'm in Los Angeles. I'm the chairperson for the Caring Connections Committee of what's known as High Village LA. High Village LA, as some of you may know, is uh, two synagogues over the last three and a half, four years who've come together to provide specialized programming and intimate caring services for seniors. Uh, we serve people who are 60 to 90 or in their 90s. Uh, we have 240 members. Um, people come to programs, uh, they uh, share interests, they are a short story group, they learn Spanish, we take them to the doctor. Um, and now during this time, uh, we are, are rapidly expanding our buddy system. And so we have people who, you know, receive calls on a regular basis from an assigned buddy. Um, the board is, uh, the board of High Village LA has also uh, assigned a buddy or an individual to check in on um, during this particular time. Uh, we have uh, several groups who are in their 80s and 90s. And so, although they're most of the time busy playing bridge, a lot of them have, um, you know, sort of self-isolated themselves and taking good care of themselves. Um, so I think that's really just a quick overview of who we are and what we do. And um, we, um, you know, are concerned and um, very anxious in some ways. And on the other hand, uh, very grateful and upbeat for the kind of support we're providing and receiving. Sherry, can I just ask a question about that? Um, with people who are isolated um, right now, do, are you able to, you know, are, have you found some good, you know, what have been the mechanisms that you've been able to help to support them like in new and have you been able to find, you know, more new and innovative ways or are there things that you particularly need to move on to change on technology wise or otherwise to be able to to oh, support people? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, Cheryl. And, and it is a work in progress. Um, and we learn as we go. Um, you know, we are dropping things off. We ask people where they want us to drop off their chicken soup. We have a number of people who have chicken soup prepared in their freezers and they, so, you know, as a result of this particular situation right now, you know, we ask them where should we leave it? Um, they tell us and so that's what we do and that's good. Um, you know, we um, are spending more time on the phone than anything else right now. Um, and, you know, some people are better at that than others. Uh, we've written kind of some brief uh, talking points to help people who can't, you know, figure out what to say when they don't have some script in front of them. And we understand that. Yeah. We've done that. And we've, we've emphasized repeatedly that we are doing this as a connection, as a contact, a conversation to just say hello what's going on you know what do you want to share with us you know what do you need from us um, and we give some examples of what we've done for other people to help the you know stimulate their thinking beautiful thanks Sherry um, does anyone else on the front lines want to talk about either some best practices that you're that you're doing right now or some thinking that you're doing about really making change to be able to serve people better uh, can I, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, I'm Stephanie in Toledo, Ohio. Um, our program is the Jewish Living Center of Greater Toledo. So we work with the 60 and better and we do um, different kinds of programming. So we offer, you know, guest speakers, we do day trips, we've done overnight trips. Um, we have exercise, art, poker, um, so we're more of a destination place. We're not kind of open. We don't have a food program. We don't have transportation. Um, so that's my biggest concern is kind of reaching out to our people. And we do have a Facebook page and, um, find me. I'm on there almost daily. So now we're kind of taking to that and really utilizing that almost daily, a couple times a day links, you know, hey, virtual tours of the national parks, virtual tours of the art museums, um, fill out your census, 
you know, things to do that will kind of keep them occupied. Um, we did videos with our exercise instructor so that they can keep up with that and include their spouses who don't normally come. Um, and we, I, I might do some Facebook lives. I might go to the park later this week and be like, hi, I'm, I'm out and about, you know, you can still do this or you can do that. So that's kind of how we're trying to keep in touch with our people when we can't see them. Yeah. I'm curious of if anyone has really been thinking about the groups that don't have technology right now and starting to come up with any, um, any creative ways to, to help with that. Um, I'm particularly thinking about seniors who are isolated in places, and I'm curious about whether you know of any good programs or projects that are starting to happen around that, given the isolation. Hi, I'm Abby Palmer with Jewish Family Services in Raleigh, North Carolina. Sorry, sorry. Um, so we've... Um, Wait, wait, wait. I think Abby was just speaking. So let's okay, Abby go ahead. I'm sorry. And then we'll take the next person. Go ahead, Abby. Thanks. So I'm um, Abby Palmer. I'm a social worker with Jewish Family Services in, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and I work with um, older adults in the Jewish community in the area. Um, several are Holocaust survivors. Several are, have no family. I have also um, seniors who are near homeless, which is a very huge concern. Um, and a lot of my seniors, um, do, I do home visits, so now I'm doing everything by phone. Most of them do not even, a lot of them don't have computers or are not savvy with that. Um, some do, and then we do have what's called, um, I don't know if you guys know, uh, doxy.me. Does everybody know about that? Okay, it's a free um, service that you can use um, that is HIPAA compliant to um, do one-on-one -on -one visits with a client on a screen. Of course, they, it's very, very simple. You just essentially send them the link, they click on the link, and um, at that scheduled time and place, they can see me and I can see them. So, um, Abby, someone's yes. asking how Doxy is spelled. D-O-X-Y dot M-E. Okay, you have to sign up for it, but it's free. And we're just starting, we're just starting this. We're in the early phases of it. Um, so the clients of mine that are able, we're going to use it. Um, we also have a group of students who said that they are able to train seniors if they have a smartphone to be able to do like a video chat on their phone. They can actually talk them through it and teach them how to do it. So we're going to partner with these students, these young people to you know, see if there's any of our seniors out there who have smartphones who want to use that. Um, we're, we do have a food pantry um, and mitzvah meal delivery. The food pantry is pickup, but we've, we've um, now scheduled to um, picking up food as a drive-through kind of system where they, it's on Wednesdays, they call ahead, we know what when they're going to, they call when they arrive in the parking lot, they pop their trunk, we bring out their bag of food, or it, sometimes we include it in that um, for some of my um, people are um, uh, grocery store gift cards, and we'll put that in the trunk for them. If they don't have transportation or can't get transportation, then we do have people who will deliver the food to them, knock on the door, leave it on the front stoop, and have to leave. Yeah. So right now, we're, we're also talking about um, doing some online groups, um, support groups, as well as um, uh, kind of educational presentations. Um, for example, we're, we're talking about doing a program for adult children of seniors who the senior is asking, why aren't you coming to visit me? Um, and, and how to kind of navigate that and how to deal with it, particularly if their parent has dementia or some level of um, 
exploring ways to do that, but that's an, um, some ideas and things we're doing. Great, um, thank you. Uh, I wanna stop because I know Joanna is now joined us. She was not able to get on because this whole, um, this whole piece is really full. So Joanna, welcome. Um, before I turn to Joanna, I wanted to suggest, I think there's probably a lot of resources that we each have. And I think we don't have as much time as we probably need to really figure out what kind of resources we all want and need. Um, I was gonna suggest that we also use the chat while Joanna's talking to either share the kind of resources you're looking for, ask a question there, um, what do you most want and need? And I think also um, I've started, there's some really incredible resources that are out there. I'm going to put some resources into the chat right now too. Um, and I would just say, uh, if you have access to really great resources about working with vulnerable people or supporting organizations that work with vulnerable people, please start to share, because I think the more that we can build these kinds of resources, the better. Um, and I don't know if JPro can be a repository or not for some of the things that we have at large. Um, here's a huge document. Um, but I think that that would be really useful to start to really share some things. This is a document that talks that you'll look at it, it is massive and been put to sort of multi-collaborator, many, many collaborators working on it. Um, there's so many different kinds of documents out there. Um, and I started a spreadsheet, I mean, I started a sheet with a lot of things on it. I just don't have all of your emails. So um, please start to share things that you think would be useful. And Joanna, welcome. So happy to have you here. Um, I, you know, we, we started sharing because there are a bunch of people on this call who do work with vulnerable populations. And I just wanted to turn it over to you as the CEO of Manny Cantor Center, who is doing some really important work right now to talk about how you're thinking about this moment with the populations and with your staff. And, um, and then we'll turn to be able to talk about how we support organizations like the many organizations that many of you work at um, and how we help move the community toward that. So go ahead, Joanna. Hi, everyone. Um, I am really glad to be on this call. And I just want to say that um, I feel that I'm in a room of colleagues. And so um, I may not say anything that you don't already know or you're not already thinking. I feel really honored to have this role of speaking to all of you. but. Um, I also know that we are all doing this work together. Um, something that's been, just, just to take a step back, um, like many of you, um, the, the community center that I oversee is continuing to deliver meals um, to seniors um, and to families that are vulnerable, um, as well as deliver um, casework support, social work support. Um, and we're also running a virtual preschool for our 250 children, um, many of whom um, don't have reliable internet access at home and um, live in settings where they're doubled and tripled up with other families, um, which leads to, you know, just a, a lot more vulnerability um, around this time. Um, they're food insecure, they're, they don't have money to buy diapers, you know, things like that. Um, and then we have a population of families that um, are upper middle class and affluent and are already saying to us, we need more, we need full day schedules, virtual, we need to be on Zoom all day with our three-year-olds, like how come you're not on top of this? Um, and so I am uh, supporting my staff as they manage um, you know, that, that diversity of needs that are coming down the pike. And I'm sure you are too, if you're also managing any of these issues, if you could just like nod or do this, because I just would love to have a sense of who's managing um, on the front lines, particularly vulnerable populations right now. I'm seeing some nods. Okay. Um, so if, if you are managing a vulnerable population, seniors or people in need, could you just raise your hand just so I could see Okay, great. So thank you. Um, so maybe others who are in this position also want to jump in. Um, 
and share what they're doing. So I think my, my biggest concern right now is the ability to keep doing that, to keep cooking meals in our kitchen, to keep having staff come in to deliver those meals um, and to continue to meet the needs of vulnerable people. We were just on a call about how we're going to deliver diapers to families, um, you know, around the city. And, you know, I'm sort of thinking, well, what if Amazon stops delivering, right? Like, you know, what's, what's going to happen um, there? And I think the other thing that I'm thinking about beyond that is um, how do we sit with um, the discomfort that this epidemic is raising kind of more generally in our sector, right? So I'm thinking about the fact that all of a sudden the picture of who is a vital worker in this pandemic has really, really shifted, right? And so I'm thinking about the people who work in the kitchen of the Manny Cantor Center, um, who I am not proud to say, but are among the lowest paid staff um, on our team and our security guards and the people who clean our classrooms and all of a sudden they are the most important people and they continue to be the least paid people. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about that. I'm thinking about whose work is considered important and whose work is considered expendable at this time. Um, and I'm also thinking about all of the issues of privilege um, that are being laid bare actually in this epidemic, which is like, who is going to continue to receive a salary? Um, me, right? Um, as I work from home and go into the office a bit, but I'm mostly comfortable working from home. Um, and I'm not worried about my ability to feed my family. Um, and, and so I think I've noticed two things in that. The first is that um, there's a lot of work going on right now that it is that is about this frantic need to continue to prove the value of our own organizations because we're so worried about fundraising and we're so worried about um, paying our staff. And I want to think about how to how we notice that, right? How we notice like who is being considered incredibly important right now and how much effort each of our our entire sector is is putting into um, how critical and important we are while many of the people whose work is critical and important are incredibly low paid are invisible to us and may well um, you know see their employment be quite insecure as a result of this um, and so I almost wish that we could ask all of the organizations in our in our sector to stop thinking about how we prove our worth um prove our value to society in this time and instead actually be valuable to society in this time um which is to say using our resources to support people who will be um out of work who will be insecure who will not have diapers who will not have food um, and to wonder how we use resources in that way. Um, and the second thing, um, yeah, that's, that's it. That's all I would say. Joanna, thank you so much for raising um, those issues. I think it's really important for all of us to be thinking about that. I, I want to say to you, and maybe I can be helpful, but I think you need to write what you just said. Um, I think we as a community need to be talking about that um, and we need to think about where our resources are most needed right now when some organizations have so much and some organizations that may need it right now may not have um, and how we sort through that. Um, and I love that you're bringing that up. Um, comments or questions or things to add around like how we think about this moment um, as not just as frontline workers, which we we're talking about, but actually now, if, as we talk about how do we support the organizations that many of you are at that are on the front lines and how, what kinds of things should we be doing to move resources to those organizations or what kinds of things can we do from our organizational perch to support 
Um, I want to just throw out a few ideas and then I want to really um, take thinking. Um, one is uh, I know that there is, you know, reaching out to organizations like Manny Cantor Center, the Jewish Family Service in your I was on a call with Federation in New York just now, and I know that they are really trying to get a handle on the needs and what's happening um, from all of the social service network that they have their hands around to the best of their ability um, so that they can share best practices and try to be helpful. Um, and so I think that letting, if, if it's feasible, letting your local Federation know or all of us trying to advocate for the organizations we know about to let them know that there are real needs if we know about those needs. Um, I think the other things that some people I have seen happen um, is obviously organizing mutual aid groups. Someone spoke about Facebook before um, and really taking the lead. I posted something by a group of 20 somethings, the website that they just like a group of 20 somethings got up very quickly to work on who needs help and who can help to try to work on delivery. It's called Invisible Hands. I, I don't know it, so I'm not advocating for it. I'm just saying there is a lot of different kinds of work that people are trying to do to step up and it's pretty impressive to use their creativity to do good in the world. Um, and I think there's also some advocacy that can be happening right now and some has already been happening, right? Paid sick leave for, um, for businesses that you know really need it um, you know for for anybody so that people can stay home um, and I know that that policies that have passed federally are not as inclusive as they probably need to be at all um, but really curious about some of the thinking about what those of you who are on the front lines what would you want to tell us about what your organization wants from either us as Jews or us as Jewish professionals from the perch of our organizations. And Joanna, let me give you the perch first to say that, and then I'm gonna pass it to other people. You have to unmute. Oh my God, like a whole new situation. Um, I think, what this crisis has revealed is what people who do direct service work for poor and vulnerable populations know every single day, which is that there is no safety net in this country. And most people in this country are one illness away from um, financial ruin. Um, they're one, you know, mistake away from spending their life incarcerated. I, I mean, it's it just on and on and on. Like, some people have paid sick time and some people don't. Some people have, uh, you know, the ability to save money and other people don't. Um, some people are paid a living wage and other people aren't. And so, like, the best thing that we can do is use this wake up call as a real wake up call that enables us to harness our energy for people to demand change. Um, it's amazing to me that within you know a minute of this virus hitting uh, the city, all of a sudden the internet companies are giving everyone free internet. All of a sudden you can't be evicted for the next 60 days. All of a sudden the, you know, schools figured out how to feed people like give me a freaking break like what was going on three weeks ago exactly the same thing and so the question is how do some of these interventions um continue on yep to so and i'm gonna people. i'm gonna yep. stop Got for it. a second because i love what you're saying um who else has something that they want to say aloud here and we can think together about how we, as a Jewish community, want to bring some of these things to the forefront. Yeah, go ahead, Wendy. You just have to unmute. Okay, hi, everybody. I'm, I'm with Carolina Foundation for Jewish Seniors in Greensboro, North Carolina. And we provide grants to uh, 
organizations like Abby at JFS and Raleigh that have direct service to uh, the Jewish senior population. However, here in Greensboro, I have a contact with um, some of the people and, and work directly with a few people myself and um, was out at one of the retirement communities yesterday. I'm one of the few people that is on an approved list to still be able to enter the campus. And what I'm beginning to see, um, and, and I'm not, organizations we fund are, what I'm beginning to really fear, especially with the older population, is the isolation. Because now on that uh, campus, they have closed the dining room to communal dining, and they have to pick up their meals uh, as, as box meals to take back to their own residence. Some of them are, are still congregating as small groups to eat together when they live in the cottages as opposed to the apartments. I Wendy, guess. I'm not. I'm going to cut you off just to say if you have a particular. We just are coming back together in two minutes. I want to hear everything you're saying. If you have a particular suggestion, put it forward now so we can hear it about what we. Need Actually, to I was looking for for suggestions of, yeah. of how to how to stem the mental illness that's going to uh, start yeah. occurring from the isolation. Yeah. Suggestions. I have been hearing about um, company, you know, groups that have gone in and helped set up tech for people. Um, it's not, a, you know, the perfect suggestion. Um, phone calls to elderly, you know, groups of volunteers that are putting phone calls together for um, people. Uh, I'll bet, I know there's creative thinking out there and it may be that we need to convene all of the groups that work with seniors, um, especially with seniors who might be isolated right now to get some of that thinking together and connect with funders. I love that you're on this call and I think it's a really important question. Um, we don't have enough time. I feel like there's so many issues we need to talk about and figure out how our community can actually step up at this moment. Um, I know that we have a little bit of, uh, we, have, we have a little bit of stuff, you know, is there any last thing that anyone wants to say about things we should do? And I'm just gonna say I'm really grateful for all the work that you're all doing. Um, this is probably just the beginning of this conversation about how we need to step up. And I would urge anyone who has, is on the front line to do some writing about it because we all need to be hearing about what it's like and anyone who has some good thinking about what we should be doing to put it out there. Um, those are my two calls for action for the people in this room. Um, and thank you for really sharing and I wish we could have shared more. Thank you. Okay. Is everyone here in breakout room four? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear. Good, thank you. Um, so thanks for choosing the best breakout of all. And um, what I wanna just remind everyone is that this is being recorded. Um, and um, there's, there's a lot of people here, so we're not gonna be able to do introductions um, but, you know, please use the chat um, to share maybe a hope for this conversation. I'm going to be a little frontal at the beginning, and then I hope we can get into more of a discussion. Um, discussion, questions, ideas, suggestions, gaps, etc. cetera. Um, so let, let me take it from, from there. And I'm going to apologize because right now I'm actually going to move uh, all of you onto my side, because as I said before, I couldn't print off my notes, so I have to look at my computer while I do this. This is the problem of working at home. By the way, I have two college kids at home taking online classes right now, and a wife who's a professor. So it's uh, we're, we're all on the internet, and uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, so my federation went into high gear about two weeks ago. We actually put a coronavirus team in place. We had our planning director, Eileen Rin, set up as the team leader. Um, just to, to explain, uh, I'm a member of the team. I'm not the leader of the team. And we put this team together to be cross-functional, 
have people with different strengths and different abilities and uh, different networks to help us look at a comprehensive community response. Um, I am a big fan of the TV show MASH. In fact, every night if I'm actually home at seven o'clock, it's on TV and I try to watch it again and again. And I, I'm reminded of what the doctors and nurses do on MASH. They, they, they have, to, have to do triage. They have to figure out what the most important things are. What are the critical things to do first? And then they break into work teams and, 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 and make things happen. And that's, that's what we've done. We've broken into different work teams and empowered them to help move things forward and make decisions. I think sometimes, especially in legacy Jewish organizations, there's a lot of oversight, people going in and asking, am I doing the right thing before they, they act? And we're trying to, to get people to, 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 to make decisions independently. And I'll just reflect back. Um, you know, we obviously in Pittsburgh have the experience of the shooting here and how we dealt with things then. So that's, uh, continues to inform the way we act to, to today. Let me go at a high level at the things we're, we're looking at. <clears throat> Community issues around our agencies. We have financial issues, and I'm sure a lot of you see those things, from JCCs that are closed down now um, to um, senior facilities that are closed up for outside people and have to put um, new, new um, procedures in place that will limit uh, probably their, their new incoming uh, uh, patients. Um, we have financial management issues. Our office is closed. Well, how do you deal with checks and uh, paying bills? So we had to put in systems in place around that. The foundation, our foundation um, uh, just a few weeks ago was at an all time high of about $280 million. As of uh, two days ago, we were at $230 million. We've corrected by 17%. The market's down another 2,000 points today. So we have to keep our uh, 1,400 fund holders uh, um, informed about what we're doing, plus, got to look at what the long term effects are going to be there. We need to run an annual campaign. Um, and so we want to keep it going because we're actually having one of our best campaigns in our community's history and we don't want to lose the, the, the momentum we have. And we also know we're at some point we're probably going to have to raise some extra dollars for the coronavirus stuff. Um, security. While our agencies are closed down, security continues to be a huge issue. Um, there, uh, and some of you may experience this, there are conspiracy theories out there that the coronavirus has been caused by Jews. So we're gonna, we're gonna have to deal with those things going forward. Um, and then uh, communications to the community about all of these things, and including one other piece that, um, that we're looking at, I'm sure other communities are too, how do we keep members of the community connected to the Jewish community? What are the types of online programs we can offer them, from adult programs to programs for families, et cetera? Our kids in our day schools are still meeting, but most of our kids go to public school. How, how do we provide programming out to them? While we're doing all of this, we got to take care of our staff. Yesterday, we had a virtual staff birthday party. I'm sure every office has those birthday parties once a month or whatever. We came together and sang happy birthday on Zoom. On Friday, we are having a virtual Oneg Shabbat. I will have a bourbon in my hand and we will do a l'chaim and, uh, and celebrate um, who we are, what we do, et cetera. My goal over starting tomorrow is I'm calling every single one of my 70 employees personally to check in with them. We know supervisors are doing that, but it's important that it come from the top. And then as far as taking care of ourselves, the thing that I've tried to explain to my staff, and as soon as this is over, I'm going to be doing that. I'm getting on my exercise bike, and I tell them I take the breaks to do that. Um, we want to model the, the, the positive um, behavior. As far as the broader community, we've held two webinars to bring community together and give them information. Our most recent one was two days ago. We were lucky enough through a connection to have someone very high up at the CDC report to our communal leadership, that's all of our Jewish institutions, about the coronavirus and for them to ask questions. By the way, really interesting um, questions about things like the Hever Kedisha and when they're preparing bodies for burial. I'm not talking about people who have uh, who've died because of the coronavirus, but just in general, how to handle that being so close with other people. 
So things like that that uh, you know typically you don't get a chance to ask. So that's a little at a high level of what we're doing. So I'm going to throw out a bunch of questions, but we can take this anywhere you want. So first, what am I missing? By the way, we may we may have done some of the things, but but what what am I missing? What else should we be doing? Secondly, how else can we engage members of the community Jewishly? I mean, this is a time when people are probably looking for community. Three, uh, how do we take an awful time in our community, one that may cause major dis disruption, and make something po positive out of it? You know, there's a there's a line that you should never miss a good crisis. And I know this is a horrible one. I've been through horrible ones, but there are opportunities here too. Um, and so those are a bunch of questions I wanted to throw out. I'm gonna put my notes aside and blow up my Zoom screen so I can see any comments that might be here. But, uh, but the floor is open. And uh, you know, uh, it's a Jewish crowd, so we can we can have questions, comments, or it's a Jewish crowd. We can start with criticism. So uh, wherever you want to go, I got all these lines. I can use them all. It just uh, don't even sh uh, raise hands because there's a couple pages. So if you just come off a of mute and speak, I just want to uh, commend you because I'm getting an email on another computer here that says you are providing uh, subsidies for your educators to connect to the North American Ely move on the 29th of March. Um, Thank you, I didn't know that. So as I said, we've given, <laughs> we've given the ability for staff to move things forward. I'll probably hear about that. We, we're doing staff meetings three times a week. So I'll probably hear about that on Friday at our next staff meeting, but thank you. I've been hearing from um, a number of people uh, that they're being really overwhelmed by the resources that are being offered right now online. So in our role as, uh, as communal professionals, um, in, in what instances do we, should we be providers and in what instances should we be connectors? Resources so, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, and by the way, it'd be great when people speak if they just uh, say their name and the organization they work for. Rich, do you mind doing that? Sure, Rich Moline. I'm with the JUF, the Jewish United Fund, the Federation of Chicago. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, just for us, uh, we're t we're t we have a, a cross-functional team that's their job is about engagement of the Jewish community, as I talked about, trying to provide programming. We do not believe we need to create all the programming. There are lots of people that are putting in organizations that are pushing programming out virtually. Um, and but we can be the aggregator of that information and and be able to market and share it. We are going to create some of our own content, PJ Library for some of our Jewish families, um, and very specifically, we have a a, a full time Jewish educator on staff, and he's now put together. Um, he shared it last night with me at ten thirty. Um, a whole um, curriculum, a, a whole set of classes. By the way, one of them I'm really excited about, we're gonna push it out to our Jewish community, which is how do you prepare for a Pesach when you're not gonna be with your family? Most people are not. This may be the first time for many people to actually run their own Seder. So, um, so that's a piece that we're, we're talking about putting out to the community. So I, I don't, I, but luckily we live in a connected world. I don't think we all have to create things from scratch, but I, but I do think um, we have a chance to connect people to, to, to resources that are out there. There was a question online about coordinating with agencies and communicating with each other on a regular basis. So um, we had a, uh, we have eight beneficiary agencies in Pittsburgh that are connected to the Federation. That's our close family. And we actually had a meeting with them Monday. We had a meeting with them last week and we're planning another meeting next week. Our planning staff has divided up uh, responsibility to liaison with each of those agencies. Another, our Jewish, one of our Jewish educators on staff, a rabbi has taken on the responsibility to be the liaison with all the synagogues. I'm taking on personally the responsibility of our two largest agencies who I think are at the most risk financially 
uh, the JCC and our Jewish Association on Aging. And, um, and we're just, we're talking to them directly and bringing them together to share best practices and so that everyone's informed. And the truth is, our agencies are already intertwined, you know, from programs for seniors, they work together already. So uh, one agency uh, has a, whatever they do has a ripple effect on the other agencies. But I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm answering for myself. I would love to hear other models out there because I'm hoping to learn from this call. You know, I do fundraising and after you ask someone for money, you, you shut up. So that's what I'm trying to do here. So some, so other people will speak. So it's John Hammerich from UJA in Toronto. I mean, we've done a whole bunch of things already. We're also helping out some of the agencies, obviously like the JCC, we're having a tough go. We've sent out stuff to all of our employees uh, because all the schools are closed on how, on all the different things they can be doing with their children, both secular and Jewish. There's a whole lot of stuff available. I'm happy to, to share that with Eric and send it out to you folks with all kinds of things that have Jewish curriculums and non-Jewish curriculums. We're redesigning our intranet. We call it the loop. So there'll be a central repository uh, of all of the information with all of our agencies and the city and the health networks and an inventory of all the emails we're sending out on these things as well. So I think we're, um, and we're going to do a kind of a a balanced sharing if we have some employees whose workloads are lighter and some that are getting heavier, looking for a way to make sure people share their workloads uh, if they have capacity. So we're doing a number of different things in Toronto. Thank you. Others? I'll, I'll, I'll read, some, there was a, I think there are a couple other comments or questions up there. Um, what else should we be doing? How do we engage? Oh, this is my notes. Look at that. Um, uh, I think it's important to continue with community life cycle events. I work at the Holocaust Memorial in Miami Beach and we'll be live streaming a Holocaust Memorial Day commemoration. So I know our Holocaust Center is actually planning the same exact kind of thing. And I believe that a JFNA is going to be pushing out a national Yom Ha'atzma'ut online celebration. Um, which again goes back to what I, I said before, we don't all have to reinvent the wheel. There, there are ways for us to come together um, as a community. So um, can, can uh, it's a Danny Reed. Danny, if you want to talk about the program you're doing with the, for the Holocaust, for Yom HaShoah. I'm looking for Danny Reed. No? Okay. A question there, how are you managing the individual agency fundraising efforts or is everyone depending on federation to raise funds that will be needed to meet their agency needs? Uh, uh, I don't have a clear answer for that one yet. Um, I think that we are going to partner with our agencies to help raise additional dollars. But the truth is that uh, each of our agencies have their own relationships with certain donors that are very passionate about each of those agencies' work, and they're going to need to approach them. Uh, but we are looking at a, an approach from the Federation to probably our big foundations right now and to um, some of our bigger donors. At the same time, what we did is we, I asked our finance people to sweep our accounts. And what I meant by that is we have funds set aside for emergencies. We have a chairs fund, we have a president's fund. We, we have funds that we set aside every year for strategic planning for our agencies. Well, no one's doing strategic planning the rest of this fiscal year. Let's sweep all those accounts and any extra dollars and figure out where, the, where they are and pool them together and know that we have an initial pot of money that we can put into, uh, into work right away. Not a huge amount. It's about $200,000 we've been able to find. It may sound like a lot of money. It's not going to go that far. But, uh, but what we're going to have to do, I talked about triage, is kind of prioritize. What's the first, what are the first things we have to do? So I'll, I'll give you an example. Our Jewish Association on Aging, which has skilled nursing and um, assisted living and a hospice and rehab and home health care, um, 
they have a challenge because their employees, you know, people who usually work in these, in these homes are incredibly passionate, but don't earn a lot of money. Um, their kids aren't in school right now and they need childcare. And if they don't have childcare, they can't show up to work. And all of our early childhood centers are closed. So how do we make sure that we can find a way so they can show up and care for our seniors? So they found a model, a firm that can come in tomorrow, literally tomorrow, and set up a daycare on site at their facility. It's gonna come at a cost. And so I'm working with them to figure out where a pot of money can come through. We need to take care of those seniors especially now we need to make sure they're safe because um, they're more prone to the coronavirus and its effects than any other population. So those are the kinds of things we're doing as we try to figure out priorities. Ah, Danny Reed, no laptop, no microphone on the laptop. You sound great though. Yoma Zikaron, a question. Um, for us, we're probably going to stream our own local Yom HaZikaron ceremony. Um, we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, if, if people know the CDC just at the, over the weekend, I think came out and said, you shouldn't do any events over the next eight weeks. So we just got that news and we're planning now. I, we, I don't know what the content will be. We're trying to keep our connections to our sister cities in Israel, Carmel and Misgav. We think it's really important. Um, so I know we'll be in touch with them as we put the content in place. Other questions, comments, and uh, questions can go for each other, yeah. please. Jeff, I have something, um, Abby Gilbert from Reconstructing Judaism, but uh, this actually comes from my uh, work as a board member at our local JCC. We run the Meals on Wheels program and we had to close down the senior center. We operate the largest senior center in the city of Philadelphia. Um, so those folks now need meals that were previously getting provided for them at lunchtime at the senior center. The Meals on Wheels program depends on older adults um, actually as the volunteers who deliver the meals in the morning. Those folks are at risk. They can't be out delivering meals. What we actually did was partner with organizations in the community whose staff are working from home as a result of this uh, situation, who therefore have more flexibility and are thrilled to do an early morning delivery before they hop on their computer in the morning but who wouldn't ordinarily have been available because they're commuting at that time. So I just wanted to share that as a way that our community has been creative in finding a human resource that wouldn't normally be available to us. That's, that's, uh, that's beautiful. I'll, I'll uh, share what I know our agencies are doing around feeding our seniors. We have, um, we have a, 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 a Squirrel Hill Food Pantry that is run by our Jewish Family and Community Service. And the way their model is, which is beautiful, um, people are typically able to go in, they get a shopping cart, and they go pick out the items that they want. Um, and we went to that model years ago because people were being given food that they didn't want and um, rather have them choose things that were nourishing, that their children liked, et cetera. Well, they, they can't have people walking through there right now. So what they're doing is um, they have a two-door system and um, a client will call and say they're on their way. They will come in the first door. The shopping cart will be there with the items that they want in a bag. They will come take their bag. The uh, staff at the food pantry will then sanitize the cart and bring it back in. So that's, that's the kind of protocol they've put in place. Our JCC runs the the county lunch program for seniors, and they got permission from the county to be able to pack bags so that people can pick them up and take them. But I will say there's been a lot of red tape and bureaucracy dealing with government changing their, their rules and regulations. Uh, I'm waiting to be in touch with our Jewish Family and Community Services that does counseling work. And they were told that a certain before this happened, they couldn't get reimbursed for certain counseling unless it was truly face-to-face. -face. So we have to see if those kind, I, I haven't talked to them in two days, we have to see if they were able to get those kinds of rules changed because 
they want to continue to provide the services, but they also need the money to be able to pay the employees. These are the kinds of challenges we're all dealing with right now. But thank you, Abby. Jeff, this is Robin from JPro. There's a lot of people who just put questions in the chat. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not good at this. Robin, you're, you're welcome to help me out here. Oh, sure. Okay, so someone wants to know, um, what are the best ways to share all of the virtual opportunities with our community without overwhelming people? Uh, I, I'll put that out to the group because I don't think I have an answer for it. Hi. So we, oh, sorry, go ahead. My name is Shani. Um, I'm the executive director of the Jewish Farmer Network. Um, and there is a Facebook group. I can go on Facebook and send it out to everyone. That's like kind of been this like awesome, like amalgamation of all of these different learning opportunities and communal prayer opportunities that are happening online. Some of them are happening on Facebook Live. Some of them are happening on Zoom, but there's like every day they're like putting out like, okay, here's what's available today. Um, so I can share that with the group and that's a great, it's a great resource. Terrific, thank you. Someone else is gonna to speak too. Yeah, uh, I'm Nadine, I'm with the Jewish Federation of Greater Portland in Oregon. Um, we have a community calendar that we run through our website that different organizations will add events to. We made um, an additional calendar like we typically would for like special Passover events and we did it for online stuff and we sent out to the listserv to have different organizations add to that calendar directly if they're doing online programming. Great. Thanks, Nadine. Say hi to Mark for me. Will do. Others? Anyone else have ideas? I, I think there is a problem because there's there actually is a lot of content out there. I see, you know, I'm getting emails from all these organizations and how do you pick and choose? Because like, I think the there's a good point there without overwhelming people. Um, and I, I don't I don't have the answer. I know that's something that my engagement team's gonna be thinking about now. So if anyone else has ideas, let me know. Jeff, I'd just like to share what we're doing at Reconstructing Judaism. We're a relatively small staff. We're an international movement, but we've got a staff of roughly 54 FTEs. So we have to be really judicious about what we spend our time on. And we're really uh, all sharing information that's coming to us from various lists and sources that we're each individually involved with, curating that, and then looking for the gaps so that what we're developing is really the things that fill in the holes where other resources don't seem to be readily available. Great. Anyone else on this question? All right, I'm gonna move on. There were other things up here, let's see. Uh, how are your staff handling their regular tasks or has everything come to a stop? So uh, we're trying to do as much normal work as possible. And I mean as possible. So I just give you my day. Um, at 8 a.m., I had a strategic planning committee meeting that was scheduled a month ago. We kept it. Um, and by the way, it was a great meeting. At noon, I had a nominating committee. We nominated our new chair of the board. Um, so we're trying to, and that's just me, we're trying to keep with as much of the normal business as possible. We're trying to keep our fundraising going. We need those dollars. Um, there are some people that we know are not as busy right now. And, um, and I have a management staff meeting tomorrow, and that's one of our major topic of discussions. We made the point to them today, and I know not every organization has this ability to say, we're not a restaurant where there's no customers coming in. In fact, customers need community right now. Your, your, your job is not at risk right now. We, we, but, but there are people that are not as busy because they can't do events. I mean, we have an event planner. They, you can't do the events in the same way. So how do we have that person help out in other areas where we think there's greater need? So really looking for people to be as uh, flexible as possible. We've asked them to let us know if they have excess time. I'm not sure how many people are honest about that and speak up, but we're going we're gonna to work on that actually tomorrow morning. Anyone else have a 
something to, to talk about on that topic? I would, I would just add, uh, Patricia Marine again from University of Chicago, I would just uh, add another question to that possibly, and that is, um, are there any, it's uncharted territory, but are there any best practices we can develop in terms of supervising staff, those of us in those positions, under these circumstances as well? Uh, that, by the way, we've, we're trying. I'd love to hear what people say about that, whether you're a supervisor or a supervisee. What, what would be helpful to, to, what are the things you would want to be doing as a supervisor? What do you expect as a supervisee in this new environment, which I do not believe is going to end in two weeks? I think we're in this for a while. So we're making sure that all of our managers check in at least every other day with their teams. Um, Jeff, I'm going to come back to your earlier discussion. So I actually set up a template that kind of has name, position, role with three questions. Is a workload that, that changed? Is it going to be less? Is it going to be more? Is it going to be less? What skills can they use that can be repurposed in your department? And what skills can be repurposed outside of your department? So we're going to have everyone complete that over the next two days just to make sure we have balanced workloads and we optimize the talent pool. Um, but 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 to your question, Rich, we're just everyone needs to check in. I mean, I had an executive committee meeting. I said, I want everyone to check in on a human level. When we when we regroup on Friday, I want to hear how people are doing. Some people are in small apartments and are going stir crazy, and some are kind of enjoying not having the hour commute every every morning and every evening. So it's all over the board, right? But you know, we've made sure everyone knows they do need to do at least every other day check in. The, I, on our at our full staff meeting this morning, someone brought up a, a different idea, which is not just about the supervisor supervisee, but but really about just having people checking in. That there's a feeling that a supervisee may not always be as honest with their supervisor, and just trying to have peers. We're talking about having some peers to do some check-ins with each other. Um, you know, we have some single staff that are all alone. And just to make sure that a friend, a buddy, is reaching out to them uh, every once in a while to see how they're doing, because this could be a very lonely time for some people. So that's beyond the, the the supervision piece. Anyone else on that topic? So I'm just going through. I'm reading more stuff here, uh, and I'm I know I'm skipping things. Um, have any organizations started making phone calls to community members? And if so, what sort of conversations are you having? Anybody have an answer on that one? We, we, we have a team. We're checking in with virtually thousands of people. Uh, everyone that's kind of not working is busy on the phones, checking with everyone, starting with the vulnerable and moving through our donor population, we're, we're connecting with almost everyone we can. We've set up huge teams. We've also taken over the um, JFN who does our, our global Seder. We've taken that over because they're not well equipped for that. So um, even though we're shutting our offices, we're putting up big tents in the parking lot. So with lots of room, so people can come and back, pack boxes uh, for the global Seder as well. And then we're also taking our people who, are, who don't want to be near anyone, but are happy to pick up and drive stuff, uh, where they pick it up at our office and then drop it off at a door, they don't have any human contact. So we've got them, them working as well. But I don't think there'll be a donor that gets a, not touched by us over the next week with a phone call. That's impressive. I wish I could say we were that good. We are not, uh, but we are, we're training our staff uh, in the fundraising area to, to touch base with all of their donors that they manage um, and in the right way. Um, and our, we have a program called Age Well Pittsburgh, which has 10,000 seniors that are cared for by three of our agencies that work through a collective impact approach. And um, they are calling every single one of them uh, to make sure they're okay and to see if they need anything. So I, I think there, there's, if people have bandwidth, there's, there's great opportunities We've talked about using volunteers for some of this because um, this is something people could do from home. And again, I think volunteers or you know, people in the community might be looking to do things. Anybody else have ideas on this one or things to share? Okay, uh, interesting question. How do you welcome support a new staff member who's starting their job during this time? 
Guess what? We had that on Monday. Our new events coordinator started Monday when we have no events. Um, and, uh, uh, but that, that person, we, they, they came on to our virtual staff meeting and we all applauded her and welcomed her on board. And I actually don't know what she's doing right now because I'm not into the details there. Um, it is really difficult uh, to, to start right now. That's all I have to say. I don't know if anyone else has had a, an experience and if they have a good experience. We have, we have a new employee starting on Monday and two new ones starting a week from Monday. I'm actually hoping, and, I'm, and, and, and just so you know, I'm the eternal optimist, but uh, we have a whole lot of information on our, our internet that never gets well read by our employees, from our, who's on all our board committees, to all of our archive videos, to our strategic plans, to our executive team's priorities, and it doesn't get as well used as it could be, and I'm kind of hopeful all of our new employees are gonna have the chance to learn all about us in a way that if they got rushed into the job and were too busy, they would never get around to. Um, I see we have uh, 50 seconds left. Um, I, uh, I like the note from Paige, uh, that, who is actually a new staff member who started two weeks ago. So uh, I think there's a lot to learn from someone who is actually that staff person as opposed to someone like me, who is definitely not. Um, are there any last things in the last 30 seconds people want to raise quickly? I'm, I'm happy to talk to anyone. Uh, I work in Moving Traditions, so you can find my information there. So happy to talk to anyone. Having been a new staff person, feeling incredibly welcome. Good, Paige, I actually think it would be good to, for someone to talk to you and, and get some learning, so it's great. Great. Anyone yeah, thank else? Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, um, I, I hope, I, I know I took some notes, so I appreciate it because I learned some things here. Goodbye. Welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you all for being part of um, meaningful discussions. And I know I'm feeling really um, settled and grounded by the discussion that I was just part of. To, um, to close out in the next few minutes, I want to invite everybody to just take a moment to reflect on whether there's one thing that you might do as a result of what you've heard or what's come up for you during this session. And I request that you put that thing in the chat. I think it'll be um, really helpful to all of us to see the, the ways that folks taking small steps can be helpful. So what is one thing that you might do as a result of what you've heard or thought about or learned or reflected on during, um, during our session and in particular during your, um, during your breakout discussions? Well, I wanna invite you to um, look through the chat, read over what folks are writing, and um, we're also going to put into the chat now, my colleague Laura is gonna put into the chat a link for a very brief um, session evaluation, which is really a way of us, um, forgive the inappropriate, <laughs> Pun, but it's what came into my mind take, to take your temperature on, um, on how this was so that we can um, gauge future JPRO programming in the coming weeks. So please take a moment, read through um, what's in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll put in the link for that evaluation. It just came up and we'll, we'll put it in again because the chat is moving quickly. Um, and in just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to our facilitators. Um, this time we'll go from group four down to group one. Um, and we'll invite each of our facilitators to share one reflection or insight or takeaway from your group conversation. Um, and we'll be making the recording of all of this available. So if you had wanted to be in more than one breakout group, you can, you can experience those other conversations. 
And so with that, um, Jeff, we would love to hear um, something that came up in your group. Um, so thank you. Group four, of course, the best group. Um, I, I, um, it was great. Uh, I learned a lot from people. I want to mention one, one piece that came up. There was a question, you know, in the middle of all of this, how do you welcome a new staff person who might be starting during this period? And uh, we actually had it in my federation, but e so much better. One of the people in our group page started within the last two weeks and she didn't get to chair a lot of her or for the details of it, but I think there's some learnings that I wanna grasp from, from, from her directly. Thank you so much, Jeff. Mind boggling to think about starting a new job right now. Um, Cheryl. Thanks. Um, it was not long enough um, to talk about the things we needed and want to talk about but I would just say that um, two big things I'm thinking about now um, from, that came from the group. One is that we really need to think about what's essential at our organizations and what might not be essential and how we can move some resources towards organizations that are on the front lines working with the most vulnerable. Um, and the idea that we just have to save our organization and the whole apparatus of it might be the wrong way to go. Um, things to think about. Um, and second is uh, that um, there's just amazing people working on the front lines doing this work and we have to find ways to appreciate them in every way possible. And many of them are unseen. They're working in our kitchens, um, they're cleaning. And so they're not the people who are the most seen and they're the lowest paid. And we're now finding that sometimes the lowest paid are the most essential in our society. And how do we hold that? Thank you so much, Cheryl. Becky. Um, we, we were able to and, um, talk a bit about ways that people are learning new things about their colleagues, um, gaining a deeper empathy and understanding of kind of the backgrounds of people's realities as well as the current work that people are doing. Um, something that I found really meaningful that we heard from, from participants was the ways that folks are um, recalibrating their availability in the sense of the kinds of work they might be offering to help with. If they either have some, some more bandwidth right now or vice versa, um, need, need more support. Um, we also talked about a lot of the fun things that, that people can do to lighten up and stay connected, um, some good suggestions about uses of Slack channels or Teams channels, you know, for humor, um, for sharing of articles, um, virtual lunches together, um, people who are stepping up and offering some of the additional skills that they have to provide, like running a meditation session and recording that for those on their team that maybe can't make it to that session but want to join. Um, so there's a lot of creativity and a lot of um, empathy that, that we can harness at a time like this um, as we as we recalibrate and reprioritize. Beautiful. And or. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all the people who were in my group. Um, we spent some time in silence uh, with guided meditations blessing um, the various people impacted by what's going on. And then we ended by blessing ourselves. Um, and it was about self care. Um, the sharing that we did do in the beginning, people brainstormed or just said their favorite thing to do to take care of themselves, knowing that none of, none of this is new to any of us, but we need a friend or a colleague to remind us to do this kind of thing. Um, so things that came up are piano, music, exercise, fresh air, cooking, drinking water, doing prayer, spontaneous prayer, and eating healthfully. These are all things like, yeah, we know that stuff. So then like the real question is, why aren't we doing it more to take care of ourselves? Because we are instruments of the good that the Jewish community does in the world. And uh, we need to make sure that we are virtuosos is what we do and that we need to hone ourselves so that we could not only be happy ourselves, but also to um, do the heavy lifting that we need to do right now. Thank you. Um, 
we're gonna we're gonna wrap in in just a moment. Um, I want to let you know that the J staff team is going to stay in the chat for the next few minutes. So if anyone wants to stick around to share anything, offer anything, um, we will be here. Once again, we would love your thoughts on this session and how we can be helpful in this time. Thank you all for being here. Um, and for those who are watching this um, as a video after the fact, thank you also for joining us asynchronously. Um, and finally, Jeff, Becky, or Cheryl, thank you. Um, this idea popped up at four o'clock on Thursday, and um, I think I emailed you at five, and you know by six or seven, you had all written back to say that um, that you would do this with us. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your leadership and for holding this to all of us.